Welcome to the Healthy Careers Podcast, where we help healthcare providers succeed on purpose. We take a conversational approach in learning from others who have been there and done that. Join us as we share expert insights from real people who are just like you, because we believe that success isn't just a destination. It's an intentional journey, and you don't have to do it alone. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Healthy Careers Podcast. I'm your host, Madison Loomis, and today I'm excited to have Dan Cole on the podcast. He was a PA before being a PA was cool, and uh, he has lots to shed in terms of insight, advocation, his leadership journey, as well as how different challenges have come about in his career throughout the times and how he's been able to turn that into something super positive and how he gives back to the profession and career now. So excited to talk about all those things with you, Dan, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you having me today. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, of course. Awesome. So first and foremost, let's highlight your expertise because you've been doing this for a long time and it takes a while to build up and you've been in the orthopedic realm the whole time, correct? Yes, I, I did a few other roles, emergency medicine, um, covered other specialties in my critical access mm -hmm. hospital as well. But the focus since coming out of school, I've always done orthopedics and some emergency medicine and some other surgical specialties as well. Awesome. Great. And why did you decide to go that route versus other specialties coming out of school? Um, you know, before I went to school, I was um, a river raft guide where I started doing wilderness medicine and swift water rescue and Mm -hmm. After college, went in and did ski patrolling. I still ski patrol now, but I volunteer versus being paid staff. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of mechanical uh, things in, in the orthopedic side that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing my clinical rotations, um, I just really I, I enjoyed the hands-on component. A lot of the injuries I saw between ski patrol and river guiding, a lot of them are musculoskeletal injuries. Yeah, and so, that's um, true. And, and a lot of them were things sometimes we could fix in the outdoors, like learning how to reduce dislocated shoulders, which was more common mm -hmm. in some of the older paddling techniques and stuff for rafting and whitewater kayaking. And we've gotten a little better and safer at now. Yeah, so. definitely. Whitewater rafting. I went for my first time this past year here in Georgia, which is nothing compared to out West at all. But <laughs> um, there was a, a place here in Columbus, Georgia, and I swear that our river raft guide hated me by the end of that trip because I the whole time we'd be going over like – what is it? The levels like there's level one, level two, level three, level four. We'd be going over yeah. the tiniest rapid and I was just screaming my head off. And he's like, we're literally just sailing. You're fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. It was, it was fun. I had gone to a summer camp in junior high. And then when I went into high school, they actually asked me to start working with them. So I started guiding when I was 15, 16 Very um, cool. and uh, kept doing it through college. And that's how I met my wife through our outdoor program. And, and my son's now back at our college at UC Davis. And he's actually mm -hmm. working for the outdoor program as a river guide as well. And all our wow. kids are wrapped in circle. Back. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, very cool. Great. And yeah, that was one of the most exhilarating times. I And I was just trying to figure out the physics of how these men were pulling up like 300 pound people that we're on these rafts, you know, and I was like, are you sure you can lift me? They're like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was a good time. That's awesome. So you do a lot of volunteer stuff. I know you mentioned, um, with a nonprofit, right? That it tell yeah, us we, a little bit more about that. We have a local 501 C3 nonprofit that is, mm -hmm. uh, advocates for outdoor, um, access to the public and, okay. um, education and utilization. And so uh, we have several people involved in the program. We teach things like leave no trace, um, mm -hmm. vehicle versus self-power travel. And I often help by contributing also some um, emergency medical things like I became a stop the bleed instructor. And so oh, for cool. some of the local overland and off-road groups, we've done um, seminars on stop the bleed for controlling hemorrhage in the pre-hospital environment, learning how to put in tourniquets, packing wounds, those kinds of things, which mm. um, People were super excited about learning how to put on a tourniquet and not be afraid of using tourniquets, things like yeah. that. I often yeah. think about that when I'm hiking of like, what if I get bit by a snake or what if, you know, I fall off this cliff because we'll go and we'll adventure in Colorado and out West and you, you've got to be prepared for those things. So if you're into that stuff, I would assume that's very exciting. Awesome. Cool. And 
I really want to talk about um, holistically your journey as a PA, the challenges that you've seen, because as I mentioned, you know, you were a PA before everybody knew what being a PA meant and how that was utilized in collaboration with healthcare teams. So tell me a little bit about like first getting out of school and getting into a practice. You told me, you know, off show, whatever, that you were the first PA within a trauma hospital. So how did you fit into that and really educate people on what your role was? Sure. So um, probably just easier to start a few years before that. When I came out of school in 2001, I started working at a trauma hospital in Kern County down Mm -hmm. in um, uh, the Southern Central Valley, uh, just North of LA. And it was the only trauma only trauma center between um, Fresno and Los Angeles was, and so it was a pretty big catchment area and highway. Really enjoyed the trauma, worked in the emergency room as well. And then I followed my wife, uh, she was an OB resident and changed residency programs from a UCLA program there to um, University of Washington. Okay. And uh, jumped up north for a couple of years. And when we came, when she was finishing up school, uh, we had a great offer. I'd been on a, this. The, the funny part about how the world works when I'd been on a mm-hmm. clinical rotation in Lake Tahoe, um, where we had worked between her applying to med school and getting into med school. I worked as a yeah. um, ski patroller and she worked at one of the resorts while she Very was cool. trying to get into school. I, but I rotated a pediatric office here where mm-hmm. I met the pediatrician while I was a ski patroller. And she took me as a student in PA school. And then she introduced me to the obstetricians and gynecologists um, who were practicing here when she heard that my wife was a resident. And that we might um, like to move here. And her partners were a two doctor practice here in Truckee, California, um, in North Lake Tahoe. And Mm -hmm. they uh, had literally practiced on their own. When one of them take a vacation, the other person would be on for a week or two weeks, three weeks. And they were like, you guys move here. You you know what it means to live in the snow and and work in the snow. You know, last two winters ago, we had 700 inches of snow. You know, people are. Yeah, Um, that's a lot of snow. (laughs) <laughs> we, have people, we have people come to the area and think that the roads are plowed all the time and that it's easy to get to work. And there's literally times where no. it's, it takes a five minute drive could take you hours depending on traffic and road conditions and snow. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, they recruited her here. And when we moved to the area, I worked for about a year in a ER in Reno, Nevada, and I had been cold calling orthopedic practices because when I came out of school in Bakersfield, I worked in the ER and the ortho clinic. And then in Seattle, I worked in the Harborview Medical Center's ER part-time mm-hmm. while I worked in an ortho clinic four days a week. And so when I came down here, I definitely knew I liked ortho and I also liked emergency yeah. medicine. Yeah. And uh, uh, as things would go, you, I sent out my resume to all these practices in Reno and contacted all these practices and all of them said, you know, most of them said, oh, we are already staffed or we don't have PAs um, or we only have a few PAs and we don't have any openings. But one of the practice managers gave my resume my CV um, to the service line director at the trauma center in the area okay. who was looking to hire an orthopedic PA because they had a community staffed orthopedic trauma center. And it was a very busy trauma center. There's only four in Nevada. There's three in Las Vegas and one in Reno. And mm-hmm. um, so we were the only one in the North um, and in the Northern part of the state. And we catch from the Oregon state line, Idaho state line and Eastern slope of California into Northern Nevada. And so we had okay. a huge catchment area. So they were recruiting and uh, one of the practices, the service line, I'm um, sorry, the medical director of the trauma service, Dr. Bray and his practice used PAs and they didn't have a residency program, but they had a very busy trauma center. And they said, well, how can we staff the service line? Well, let's hire um, a yeah. PA. And so um, I was the first PA that they hired for the orthopedic trauma service. Mm-hmm. I had to write, I literally wrote my own privileges. You know, we talk about learning and experience. It was a real yeah. eye opener for me because they told me what my job was. And then I read my privileges and realized I couldn't do my job with the privileges I was given. And I said, I work mm. for the hospital system. You guys want me to do this. Um, but this is what you're telling me I need to do. And this is what my privileges say I can do. Right. And, and that's where I kind of started learning a little bit more about advocacy as well, because even some of my privileges had language that was out of date to the state law that had already been changed, but the privileges mm-hmm. had never been updated. <laughs> and then I, I uh, started working very closely with our medical staff services director. Okay. And she was, fa- she was fantastic. And she taught me a ton about internal operations. And I showed her all the current state laws in Nevada. And we rewrote my privileges. They let me collect from other facilities. And I wrote my own. And then I hired a partner within a year. Awesome. And we staffed this trauma center that was 
550 beds when I started. And by the time I was leaving, it was uh, 10 years later, it was 850 beds. Wow. And we had actually started an ortho trauma fellowship because we were so busy that the orthopedic surgeons recognized they could train orthopedic surgeons in trauma there and they were credited. Right. And they were a bit unique because they were one of the first ones to add um, business curriculum. Uh, they were okay. they staffed by a private, private, um, all private practices. And they wanted residents to learn, our fellows, the, after training, to learn how to mm -hmm. also run a business and be financially solvent. Yeah. And so um, Nevada at the time, the uh, PA Academy in Nevada was um, fairly inactive. It was hard mm. to get a hold of, even the AAPA gave me contact information that was out of date. And when I asked him, I said, well, who do I talk to? Because I'd been in California originally, which had a very active academy and right. even in Washington, they had a very active academy. Sure. And I said, oh, well, these are the contacts we have for Nevada. I'm like, they're all expired. <laughs> and, uh, and so these the academy- people are nowhere to be found. <laughs> no, and so the academy gave me a few other contacts and eventually I did get in touch and um, started working with them uh, as uh, just a contact and asking them questions about practice in Nevada and what I needed to do. Yeah. And ulti ultimately, um, I became, uh, I, I uh, asked to run for a director at large position in the Nevada Academy of Physician Assistants mm -hmm. and um, took that role. And one of the things they needed was uh, a representative to attend and listen at the state medical board meetings because. Um, even though the majority of the population in the state lives in Las Vegas, the medical board actually functions primarily out of Reno. Okay. Um, and we had representatives in both communities, but they needed someone to go to the board meetings, which I started doing. Mm -hmm. And um, that really introduced me to uh, some amazing people at the AAPA as well. Cause at the time uh, we had Ann who was their state advocacy director and we had uh, for the AAPA and she really, yeah. Uh, helped uh, many state academies um, and mm -hmm. members grow into those roles. She was fantastic. And she happened, uh, unbeknownst to me at the time, she, she lived about 90, 70 miles away from me. Uh, oh, wow. And, and yeah. she worked remotely for the academy. And then she traveled all around the country. Um, and she was truly their experts interacting with state medical boards. Uh, and so... Mm -hmm. Uh, she was one of my first introductions along with another uh, person. Her name is Trisha Marriott, who was in their ad, uh, reimbursement department. It okay. was very, very helpful for me when I had questions mm -hmm. about finance and billing and state yeah. laws. And so both of them taught us a lot. And then we had some bad legislation and changes in our practice law in Nevada that required mm -hmm. us to organize and come up with reasons why that wasn't okay and to, to, to try to um, begin to advocate more for the profession of the state. Yeah. Uh, and there was a private uh, university uh, in Southern, in Henderson, Nevada, teaching PA programs. Um, uh, but one of the things that really also helped the state of Nevada is when the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, opened a PA program. Okay. And the chair of the program is one of our past presidents of the Nevada Academy of Physician Assistants, uh, Brian awesome. Lau. And he's been a great advocate uh, because Northern Nevada was known that the people in that area who wanted to become a PA would have to go to Southern Nevada or go to another state because they were part of the Western University Exchange Program, but okay. there were no there were no state based PA programs in Nevada. Mm -hmm. As people know, when you go um, to PA school, a lot of times your job opportunities and where you feel comfortable taking a job is tied to where you do your rotations. Yes, yeah. And so a lot of the people would leave the area and never come back. Mm -hmm. and so, because um, they were going up to Oregon and Washington or California for a lot of their training, and then they would stay. And so they developed yeah. this program and they've been going for five plus six, six years almost um, and uh, been involved with it for interviewing applicants, reviewing applications and actually doing interviews for people who get through the screening process. And then I yeah. help teach their um, musculoskeletal radiology and sometimes suturing. And I was down there last week with their second years, refreshing them on splinting uh, techniques cool. and how we splint. It's super fun to be involved with them. And they yeah. really... They have very engaged and active students mm -hmm. who've been very involved in the state academy. Mm -hmm. um, and so being involved in the Nevada County drove my interest. And ultimately, uh, I also applied for other roles um, with the American Academy of PAs. And okay. I also became involved with the PAs in ortho surgery. Uh, yes. And then Dr. Bray was a president of the Orthopedic Trauma Association. He was one of the first private practice. There was like one other in, uh, private practice orthopedist in that 
a non, uh, what was typically an academic organization. Mm -hmm. And he helped me set up um, with uh, Dr. Archdeacon from Cincinnati, another great PA advocate um, who did PA and NP education around Cincinnati. But um, they set up a program for the OTA to okay. create um, foundational ortho trauma training for PAs and NPs. We set it up cool. during the annual meeting, and that's been yeah. going on since 2012. Um, Very that nice. Continued to grow, so it's been super fun. So the education side, but then I also applied for the National Quality Forum. Was looking for a PA representative who practices in a rural uh, area. Yeah, I saw I, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So once I was here in Truckee, um, we are a critical access hospital with 25 beds in a town of 17,000 people. Mm. Uh, North Lake Tahoe has about 40,000 people in the whole Northern area. And then we catch to six counties and two states and about a hundred thousand people in total. And we have two other critical access hospitals that feed to us who don't have uh, surgical services. Mm -hmm. And so to the North of us, an hour, an hour and a half, um, there's two other smaller hospitals. Since we're all California based, we get a lot of their California based insurance as well. Yep. Cause they can't, they can't go to Reno. Um, and then, the National Quality Forum led to some great opportunities, uh, spoke to the Senate um, Rural Health Work Group on okay. PA utilization because there was still some federal um, laws that were not um, great for PAs, as particular Medicare regulations for paying for um, services. PAs mm -hmm. were at a disadvantage for a long time where Medicare said they could pay uh, nurse practitioners and physicians directly. Yeah. But PAs could not be paid. It had to go to their employer, which created a lot of confusion when um, tracking the work that people were doing because the bills would come back and they weren't necessarily sure who provided the services yeah. and split shared visits. But also direct payment bill uh, allowed the bills to be submitted under the PA and clarified things like part time and locums work, which mm -hmm. um, uh, ultimately it had been sitting as a bill for a number of years pre COVID. And then it got attached to the COVID omnibus bill. And they changed the Medicare regulatory uh, process for payments to PAs. And now you can't have direct payments. So it's very clear you can be a 1099 employee um, right. and do contract work when before it was always a bit of a gray area. But it sure. also made employers who were hesitant to use the PAs and didn't know how to necessarily pay them in that relationship. Now that barrier is gone and it's the same structure as yeah. um, uh, P, uh, as a paying a nurse practitioner or a physician sure. for their services which yeah. has made some neat opportunities. I think that's, that's yeah, I think that's the biggest change because you look at the discrepancies between like there's this ever growing battle and I, I've seen this and I didn't know about it for the longest time. But when you talk to like an NP or a PA and if a practice will post like we want an NP or a PA, right? Mm -hmm. And within orthopedics more so you see PAs from a surgical component because a lot of times they have more of that training than, you know, an RN who maybe was in the ER or wherever else. But, um, you know, you look at the differences between it and it's like this ever growing battle between like, oh, the NPs are taking our jobs or the PAs are taking our jobs or they have more autonomy than us. And, you know, I had a, somebody on this podcast, Tracy, who's great at explaining, you know, if you're autonomously seeing patients and you're billing the same things as the physician, mm -hmm. then there's no reason why you can't be getting paid for that. And I think for a long time, PAs were seen as the undertaking rather than being a collaboration. And so mm -hmm. now it's like, you know, you can actually measure what you're producing before there was no way to do it. So not only when it comes to a perspective um, from a business standpoint to look at it and say, oh, the PAs are bringing in this amount of money or whatever, but you personally as a PA can say, hey, I've produced X, Y, and Z so that when you go for your raises or when you go mm -hmm. for a new job or for that bump up, you actually have data to prove like, this is what I've done, <laughs> which yeah. I think is so key for mm -hmm. just, you know, that next step and making sure that PAs are paid and Fairly. So it's um, to, to tip my hat to my nursing and nurse practitioner colleagues. You know, my mom mm -hmm. was a nurse. My mother-in-law was a nurse practitioner, a certified nurse midwife. But yeah, I think the reason they've been more successful at times historically is that they had often tied to nursing lobby groups and the nurse practitioners were tied with them and they had a very large voice, um, large yeah. membership, and large voice, and they were organized, very organized. And I mm -hmm. think that as the, I've seen through my career, uh, the 
numbers of PAs practicing increase. You know, when I came out of school, uh, I think there was closer to uh, 100,000 PAs and now there's over 170,000 PAs and we're, we're yeah. teaching 10,000 PAs a year graduating, if I remember most recent data saying. Uh, yeah. And so the state academies across the country, if you look on LinkedIn, there's the postings about things like the licensure compact. We're seeing mm-hmm. this momentum build. We're seeing these state academies really promote the practice much better than we did in the past. You know, right. Utah, Utah recently passed the law with a certain number of hours. You no longer required a collaborating agreement, supervising agreement. Mm-hmm. We're, um, we're seeing these That's multi-state fantastic. compacts for licensing that now will make it so much easier for people to apply in one state and possibly mm-hmm. work in another. Um, I just recently, I, I volunteered with the Nevada Academy. I volunteered with the American Academy of PAs and the PAOS and OTA, but I just recently signed up in the last um, couple months. I became part of the professional practice committee for the California Academy of Physician Associates. Okay. And they have, um, we have the largest population of PAs practicing in the country from the last data I can recall. Um, and so it, they've done a, a really good job of advocating. And one of the issues mm-hmm. actually is still a billing law in California for our version of Medi-Cal, uh, Medicaid is called Medi-Cal. Okay. And they have a billing policy that says um, we have we can be list, listed as the performing provider, but they still require that it be billed out under the supervising physician. Which, and then in the last few years, they changed the law fantastically. We have now what are called collaborating agreements. So we've gone from being supervising um, physician um, physicians to collaborating physicians mm-hmm. and, and a big improvement in our um, reducing our administrative burden for the physicians that we're working with um, in the right. state. And yep. that was a big victory with state bill 697. Hopefully I say that right. But uh, that was because <laughs> there's quite a few numbers and letters, but the Senate bill. Um, Sounds good to me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure my colleagues will correct me. They'll correct me if I get it wrong, but it, it, it really was a big change in the state of California. But now they have a proposal to fix um, the Medi-Cal billing issue mm-hmm. and that uh, it be billed directly to the provider of the service. And to your point about invisible billing earlier with Medi- Medi- Medicare policy, this Medicaid policy in California makes it look like the bill when it's paid was done by the supervising physician or collaborating physician, um, yeah. not the PA. And so it's very hard in, especially a small hospital like my own, where we're not mm-hmm. as sophisticated for our revenue cycle um, services sure, and sure. what we can do to pull out that data and su- see who actually did the work. Right. Um, and so then therefore they hide your work a little bit. And so mm-hmm. um, it's definitely a concern that when someone's looking at how much we're contributing and whether we're covering our costs or being profitable, mm-hmm. Uh, those types of things, um, they're not getting good information in, so they're not getting yeah. good information out. And that's something I learned a ton from the American Academy of PAs and being involved with them and their um, reimbursement committee. Uh, they have a, a Michael Poe runs the service line now and Sandra okay. Kamala, and they are amazing resources. And when people are like, well, why do I want to belong to APA? I say just alone for the reimbursement and advocacy information that you can get that will make you more successful in your practice, you know, yeah. ultimately in the, our hospital here in Truckee, the small hospital, um, I was brought on to help reorganize the inpatient orthopedic care while we were working with a private practice that ultimately the hospital bought. Mm-hmm. And I was the director of the service line before we integrated with the practice. And okay. we, um, we had to do a lot of work on tracking and understanding our revenue and our cost yeah. and, um, it was very challenging, you know, because you recognized that uh, a lot of even our revenue cycle folks didn't understand how mm-hmm. to bill um, for PA and NP service as well. Yeah. And you point out, hey, we've missed this revenue. And they're like, well, we don't have enough resources even to go back and rebuild those things. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. really? You're just going to, they're like, yeah. Skip over don't. it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in rural communities, we, you know, we really look at, you know, how can we use PAs and NPs to mm-hmm. bridge the access gap? And yeah. there's, there's so much now as the state laws have been evolving that are really allowing PAs and NPs in those areas to maximize their contribution. Yeah. And, and the uh, us versus them in, uh, mentality you mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, I do want to say I was just at the American Academy of PAs um, Executive Leadership Conference. Um, February oh, was cool. in La Jolla. Yeah. And one of the keynote speakers was they sat down with the nurse practitioners president and the American Academy of PAs presidents. And um and they Literally. fought. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, just uh, literally two two big recliners, uh, big cushy chairs at the front of the room with a couple hundred people there who represented leaders in, across the country of major organizations using PAs and MPs. And yeah. Had a conversation about how it's not productive um, yeah. to compete with each other. And instead, mm -hmm. how can we help each other both promote these roles for PAs and nurse practitioners? And, 100%. Um, you mentioned uh, orthopedics and I would, there's definitely regionally in many parts of the country, there are variations on what services NPs versus PAs are doing also based on the local training programs and what they're producing yeah. and keeping in those areas. But a lot of people don't realize I'll, I'll put on my hat. I was the medical liaison for the AAPA to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I recently turned out, uh, but when advocating for PAs and ortho to them, I, I remind them that Orthopedics is the second most popular specialty now for PAs in practice. Mm -hmm. So family practice is about 16% of PAs, and they say between 9.5, 10% of PAs practice full-time in orthopedics, which is over 15 to 17,000 PAs. Yeah, that's And there's incredible. about 32,000 full-time practicing orthopedic surgeons, depending on the data you read. Yeah. But um, over uh, the majority of them are over 50, and they've recognized that they are not going to train enough orthopedic surgeons to match yeah. the retirements that's coming, uh, the surge that's coming. And there's been a lot of conversations about how do we keep orthopedic surgeons in practice? Um, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just retiring, can they transition to part-time or reduce roles? Uh, how do we augment them? Right. And, and, and so there's a lot of discussion as well. And I have great conversations at these conferences. I've done a couple of their instructor course lectures where we had panel mm -hmm. PAs and physicians talking about how do we expand access to the orthopedics care with yeah. highly trained people who may not be physicians, but who support uh, the surgeons. You know, I, what mm -hmm. I, when patients ask me, how do I differentiate myself? The majority of my practice is um, outside the operating room. I can do pretty much the same tasks and procedures out, um, that I can yeah. as my surgeon. And, sure. and, my, yeah. and my goal is that I should only be do services that otherwise would have to be done by a physician or a surgeon, meaning we're not mm -hmm. being asked to do tasks that normally the medical assistants would do. Or think, right. You're um, not, a, yeah, not a glorified yeah. medical assistant. Yeah. Or you're not a scribe. Um, yeah. And that uh, what, you know, the one thing I, I can do surgical procedures under local anesthetics, I just currently can't um, do things under general anesthesia, nor do I say I want to. I, I love, <laughs> I've worked with over 40 orthopedic surgeons and 23 plus years of practice. And wow. I really, really enjoy um, working with a variety of different surgeons and different specialties and learning yeah. from them. And I say it 23 years in, if I'm still not learning every day, I'm doing something wrong. Um, yeah. Because uh, there's so much changing too in orthopedics. Like you look so much, at yeah. these procedures with minimally invasive stuff that you can yeah. recover within, you know, two seconds after surgery. And you're like, whoa, what do you mean? I can do jumping jacks 10 minutes after my hip replacement. Right. Um, so it, it is an exciting time. And I think too, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, you know, within what I do, we primarily focus within orthopedics. And from my own standpoint, number one, you know, transparently, it's because I have a family member that is an orthopedic PA. And so understanding from his standpoint, you know, about that and, and being introduced to that, but also, you know, I'm super into fitness and wellness. And so, as you said, when you're into that stuff, you see a lot of injuries of people that get hurt in the gym or, you know, I do CrossFit and I've seen plenty of CrossFit injuries. Um, I've had my own injuries, right. Where you go and, you know, you work with orthopedic and or PTs and, and of that realm of people. And you think about the aging populations, right. Of people that, you know, even in my gym alone, there's this hilarious guy who's like, you keep working out. Cause I've got two bionic hips and this and that. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. so many more people with that boomer population getting into the sixties and seventies, you know, they, are going to need orthopedic care and they're going to need it to where they can get back to their daily activities and living. And I think that it's just such an interesting shift that we're seeing in medicine um, because placing PAs in orthopedics, placing physicians in orthopedics, there's a lot of people that you talk to are coming out of fellowship and they've got all these new fancy things that they're doing. But then you can talk to somebody that's 80 years old who's still a spine surgeon and they're like, I'm doing this until the day I die, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it's just a fun specialty overall. <laughs> uh, 
I, I would say uh, I've had my own fair share of orthopedic injuries and surgeries. And yeah. definitely um, I joke at times with my younger PAs to be able to counsel patients. You don't have to have all the same surgeries as they do, um, but I've had quite a few of them. Uh, yeah. and, and so uh, we have a very active population here in North Lake Tahoe. I have 60, mm. 70, 80 year olds who are skiing five to seven days a week. Wow. They're downhill skiing, they're cross country skiing, they're hiking and biking in the summertime. Um, pickleball has been fantastic for orthopedics. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Pickleball. Um, oh my gosh. The yeah. craze is unreal. Yeah. We, uh, our, our local CrossFit gym is actually owned by, um, uh, the, the husband of one of our OR nurses. And so we always joke with them that it's job security, but we also, some of the best, fittest, most yeah. active staff members and people in our community, the, um, uh, are all members of the gym, you know, they do yep. a fantastic job. And so, and they're very good about, um, they, prevention. Joking, they yeah, prevention. <laughs> and then also when people are injured, they're also very good about modifying activities, but keeping people right. able to do them. So, yeah. you know, I, I think it's fun. We joke sometimes it's a bit unusual with our population, um, mm. locally because they are so active and people move here to play, but we yep. also, because we feed from such a large area, we also feed from some communities that, are definitely much more, um, uh, uh, much less active by choice, but by occupation. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, we have uh, uh, to the north of us large communities that are based on agriculture and lumber industry and mm -hmm. other um, industries like that that are very physical. We have a huge uh, resort communities up here that require a lot of staff to keep the hotels and the facilities open. And yep. for them, if they can't work, um, they're out of they're out of income. And yeah. so, uh, it's a, and it's not a cheap place to live. And so, yeah. um, it's, we, you know, there's very different motivations at times people focus on the, the luxury homes and the, and, uh, but the service providers, the people who are working in the restaurants and the hotels and the ski resorts, mm -hmm. uh, all need to work and they need to get back to work as soon as they can when they're injured. Yeah. It's the same, honestly, where I live. I'm about an hour outside of Atlanta and we're in a very rural area that is blue collar workers. So, you know, construction companies and manufacturing. And I think there's maybe two orthopedic specialty practices here. And most of your specialty places, it's few and far between. It's like, hey, you got to drive to Atlanta to go see that person, you know. Sure. Um, and from a talent acquisition standpoint, it's also very difficult on um, being rural and trying to get the best of the best who want to come out here and work because it's like, hey, <laughs> we're in this podunk town in the south and um, we've yeah. got a Walmart and a few restaurants. <laughs> um, but it's, it's interesting because then I recruit for some larger areas, you know, like you look at San Fran or you look at Tampa and it's like there's people lining up out of the door because orthopedics is just so sought after. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it's interesting, interesting, the disparities. Well, and in some of those areas, um, it's tough to recruit as well because they're so popular that they pay less. And so I mm -hmm. know some... I know some orthopedic surgeons who tell me in Southern California and some of these communities that they're, which are very expensive and popular places to live, but they also come with a lot of competition for the roles that are there and they come with lower compensation. Yeah. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, sometimes living in a rural area, maybe making a little less, but your cost of living is significantly less and oh, yeah. your quality of life may also be somewhat better. You know, we have a fellowship trained orthopedic trauma surgeon, two sports medicine docs. And we have a generalist who went through a strong program where he got a lot of trauma foot and ankle surgery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were the one of, but at the same time, we were one of three hospitals in Northern California to get a new robot system for total knee replacements. We were able cool. to advocate with our hospital and our hospital foundation said, this sounds great. We'll pay for the robot. You guys bring it in. It's different. No one else even 30 miles I would love to see that. east of us was using it and uh, they're using yeah. older style robots. And we said, Hey, this, this will definitely distinguish us. Mm -hmm. And uh, our surgeons recognize when things need to change. And some of them went and trained 15 plus years ago on doing direct interior total hips with mm -hmm. a quicker, shorter recovery time. The results are the same in a year. Everyone needs to know that, but their recovery time was quicker and patients had um, mobilized quicker and were happier and, and they've been doing it longer than anyone else in our area. So it's been fun yeah. to see that they can be that agile as a small practice yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, yeah. I think there's, and 
kind of back to what you were saying too with the rural thing and then the NPs, like that is a majority of the practices out here is there's a few MDs and then you go and you don't see an MD. Like their, their waiting lists are out the wazoo. You see an NP and some people have a problem with that. And I'm like, I don't have any issue with that. You know, like I'd rather be able to spend 30 minutes and really talk through what I'm going through than feel like the doctor's running in and running out because you're one of X amount of patients and, sure. you know, especially in primary care, family medicine. Well, and even in orthopedics, you know, you bring up rural communities. Um, there's several Western states where they these they talk to orthopedic PAs who are in very rural communities and they're running a clinic because the community could not function uh, for musculoskeletal care, couldn't support an orthopedist, but they have relationships with orthopedic groups. Maybe they're mm -hmm. working in that rural clinic for the orthopedic group, or they're referring patients to that group when they actually need a surgical intervention, but they're doing the initial right. evaluation. They're doing the injections and the physical therapy. Mm -hmm. They're saving those people the travel time. And then when they do send them to an orthopedic practice, they have a package of someone who's ready for surgery and understands that they've done everything else that they can yeah. before surgery. And, or they have surgery and then they do their follow-up care in their community. One of our mm -hmm. orthopedic surgeons here in our practice um, stopped operating and then he reduced his practice. But for the last 15, 20 years, he's been practicing 90 miles north of us one day a week. And so he sees the patients, he evaluates them, he does the treatment and yeah. um, he sends them to us for surgery. And then we do the rehab and he wants help in his practice and it's a non-operative practice. And he, He's, you know, he's talked about, well, why not, why don't we have one of the PAs coming there to help him as well? Because we could do out, outpatient, we can do very yeah. much the same things. And yeah. They can, and the PAs the can handle all that. Yeah. And, and, and he's worked with us and he knows what we know and he was comfortable and, and we're exploring all those things, you know, as mm -hmm. we try to keep coverage in that area. And especially as he gets later in his practice, he's not interested in working more, but he's like, yeah, if we need more yeah. help, let's bring in. Um, a, a PA or someone who's not worried about needing the surgical volume because then mm -hmm. you bring in another surgeon. A lot of times they need the surgical volume and their hospital is really not set up right now to do any surgeries for orthopedics. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. But they still it's, keep their patients and do the workup and take, get great care. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool how the healthcare thing is evolving and how people are getting so creative on ways of providing that care, which I think is vital. And I think that PAs allow places to do that because without that, it's like people are just going to go without it. Right. You know, so. I, I think it's deceptive when you look in California and people think we um, have these huge, we have these areas with huge population densities. Mm -hmm. California is a massive state and we have so many communities that are not only geographically isolated, but for us in the mountains, these communities, um, when we have snowstorms, I'm, I told you we had 700 inches two winters ago, mm -hmm. and this winter we're, we're doing very well, but we're not as much as that year. But they, those patients can't travel very, you know, it's very difficult to travel uh, far to get their care. And so mm -hmm. if they can stay in these uh, mountain communities like we have, we provide a critical service. And they also like being in a smaller practice. And we have a lot of patients who could go to some of the bigger practices. And they've said, we'd rather go to a smaller practice. We feel it's more um, appropriate yeah. to what we were used to and what we like. And everyone right. knows your name and they remember mm -hmm. you. And you don't feel uh, more like a number. And, the, you know, the volume is, is not as much of a focus. And because we're smaller, we're able to do that and manage our, our costs and our overhead and be yeah, financially absolutely. a very significant contributor to the um, health system as well. You know, yeah. Um, but only recently did we get really good, um, to your point, really good uh, RVU and production information and charges and collections. And mm -hmm. um, it's been super exciting. You know, we went to Epic in 2016, okay. um, but we we're so small, we couldn't afford our own. And so we uh, had a fa we have a fantastic chief information officer, Jake Dorst, who had practiced in huge health systems across the country. And he said, well, how else can we get you the most current EMR? And he started mm -hmm. looking at other health systems and how to host us yeah. through other health systems. And yeah. Ultimately, he tied us to Mercy in the St. Louis area, mm -hmm. which is uh, like 44 hospitals. And we became a satellite for them. Oh, and, very nice. Uh, we even went around and offered to other community hospitals, hey, if you want to hub off of us into Epic mm -hmm. Mercy, then we could do that. And he set that up so that we could also become a, a center point for them on the West Coast. Yeah, but, that's great. 
now we're still learning uh, this many <laughs> years later and uh, gaining a lot more information about what we can get out of Epic and how do we yeah. um, build that. Use the Epic. data. Yeah. And that was one of the great things at AAP at ELC were two talks on informatics. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating yeah. right now to see these uh, PA leaders um, like Wake Force uh, PA leader was speaking about it as was mm -hmm. um, Oshner's. And okay. um, another from Hartford, Connecticut, they all do mm -hmm. fantastic presentations on how they're using their EMR to better document and attribute the contributions of their PAs and their NPs. And mm -hmm. they talked about things like being able to figure out what specialties spent the most time having to go through past medical records in the chart because maybe the chart wasn't prepped as well. And they could see that sure. they were yeah. spending a lot of time going through the chart. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, how do we make you more efficient? How can we prepare the chart? So when you're seeing these patients, you're not having to spend as much time digging through the chart for the information you need. So yeah. really interesting thoughts. And there's a lot of like, I'm a, a data nerd. I used to recruit in tech too. So yeah. I have a huge love for that. And just as like a business owner, I love looking at numbers because I'm like, that's how you tell a story. Like without the numbers, everything that you're saying is just yeah. kind of your perspective of it. But um, you know, I used to recruit in tech and you see so much of this AI stuff coming out now too, where it's mm -hmm. like software that overlays on top of your, you know, system mm -hmm. that then can just shoot out random stuff that the second that you see the patients, like you don't have to spend but 10 seconds going over it with them 30 seconds because it's all right there. And it's in a very digestible, efficient way for you to take that information um, and even just looking at it too, from a perspective of, you know, talent acquisition of, okay, like if somebody comes and works with us, how long is it taking us to actually see our ROI on that person? Right. right. Um, how, how much are they, are they bringing back to us in terms of their ROI? And I think all of that, and then coupled with all of this, like AI that's happening in healthcare tech is going to be super fascinating over the next few years to see once that's implemented, how much more efficient healthcare can become. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps to kind of mitigate the push with reimbursements decreasing. And so there this being this push to see people quicker and taking away from patient care. Mm -hmm. But if we can implement something that makes patient care better, well, then we're at least hopefully moving that needle a little bit towards <laughs> more on, you know, the outcomes versus just the invoice. No, and it's interesting you say that I was trying to pull up um, the information, but uh, one of our reps uh, has uh, one of our implant reps was exploring mm -hmm. other other revenue streams um, with a job change. And he joined an AI company that mm. um is now helping hospitals look at their billings and making sure that they're billing correcting and capturing all their services they can. And one of his biggest targets right now are these rural hospitals. So he's been soliciting Nevada Rural Hospitals uh, Association. They have a, and they, yeah. there's similar ones for California. And to your point about being financially viable, making sure you're getting paid for the services you're already providing, which is a yeah. conversation we've had here before in our rural hospital is do we need to see more patients or do we actually need to get paid for what we're, we're doing? Right, right. And, and so he joined a company called Jory and they um, look at your billings. And Jory, they make sure, I yeah, spell it. J-O-R-I-E. And they will look at your billings and make sure that you're actually capturing all the revenue you should be. And so they've what they've done to get facilities interested, they will screen your billings for free for a period oh. of time. <laughs> And, and they're like, hey, look what you lost out on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And yeah. Um, and so uh, when you talk about applications of AI and, and being mm -hmm. a numbers nerd, yeah, I went I went back and got my MBA in health administration because when I was the service line director, I realized, you know, advocating for full reimbursement um, rec and having our our revenue cycle department actually bill for the services we're doing and when they weren't. Yeah. How do we rectify that or how do we educate them on the opportunity? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's been super helpful to be able to talk about things like contribution margin and returns on investment, getting people to understand, yeah. um, you know, and you can't expect a, a PA or a nurse practitioner to produce as much as a physician in the same hour when you sometimes don't give them the same number of space, rooms, appointments, support staff. But yeah. at the same time, um, I point out that, well, maybe they're generating more money because they cost less in a short period of time. 
And so the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, when I gave one of those talks, I had a great surgeon stand up and he said to me, why well, see six patients an hour? And I said, that's fantastic, sir. You know, that you've obviously gotten very efficient. I said, but how many patients in an hour does your PA need to see to break even and cost you nothing? And, and he said, I, I don't know, but I expect them to see six. And I said, right, but what you should ask first is, what do you, how many do they need yeah, to see before yeah. they cover their cost? And then how do you also incentivize them and benefit both of you to see more and yeah. be happy about it? And, uh, and afterwards he took me aside and he's like, I never had even thought of that. And that makes so much sense from a business mindset because yes. they do, they cost about a third per hour or so, um, depending on the specialty, mm -hmm. 25%, 25% to a third in a lot of the specialties and in primary care, maybe 50% yeah. of the same cost. And he said, but yeah. I hadn't really thought of it that way. He said, yeah, figure it, figure it out and then help, help them understand too. I say to PAs and NPs all the time, what do you cost your practice? And they say, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what's your benefits? on mm -hmm. top of your base. What are, what are they paying for your malpractice? What are they paying for everything else? Your licensing, all those things, add it all up. And then that's how much you cost them per hour if you divide it over that year. And then, you know, figure yeah. out how do you cover that? And then maybe how do you have a conversation of, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm making want, more. I'm making yeah. more. I'm covering my cost. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm multiplying revenue over my cost, which in yeah. like my, in my specialty, at least in orthopedics, it's, very realistic that, you know, if yep. um, I make the OR efficient, we flip rooms. That was something we never did before with our surgeon. And literally today, we the OR can't keep up with us doing, we did four total hits and they couldn't keep up with cleaning the room and setting up the room for the next case because we just don't have that many rooms. Yeah. Um, but we make our rural OR very, very efficient and in a much shorter yeah. period of time, we're generating a higher number of cases than we used to. Mm-hmm but it's still not the most efficient way sometimes to use us because we can yeah. generate often more yeah. money in the office seeing several patients mm -hmm. in an hour than what we make assisting. But one that you bundle us into what the surgeon's generating to the practice and you recognize that without us contributing, then he, he couldn't be as productive as he is. And all yeah. of a sudden yeah. the practice <laughs> manager and everyone else goes, holy cow, you're right. His production has gone up with you guys there. He's working yep. fewer hours per day but he's doing more work in those hours and he's happier because he's going home at one or two in the afternoon and you guys are finishing discharging and seeing all those patients. Yep. And, but he's done the same amount of cases that he used to go till six or seven at night and go home exhausted and frustrated. Exactly. And, yeah. And, 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 yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too, when people try to fight back because sometimes I'll talk to an organization and they'll tell me that they want to hire another physician. And sometimes you look at their model and it's like, why? Why aren't you hiring APPs instead? Because if you have a PA that is handling, you know, it, and we'll take orthopedics, for example, post, you know, a surgery, a hip replacement, and they're doing the post-op care and they're handling the clinic, I think where a lot of places go wrong, and when I see from a talent acquisition standpoint, when I'm like, hey, yeah, I understand that you haven't utilized an agency recruiter, that you haven't looked at the data, but, you know, I'm seeing that you're seeing a 50% growth, but your average tenure is less than two years. So something's going wrong here, right? And it's that they don't have any type of bonus outside of, you know, maybe they get some first assist money, but in a clinic, if they're needing to see X amount of people per day, you know, 30 people per day, well, then you're making a lot more than what you're costing. And you've yeah. got to be incentivized and motivated for that. And in any other industry, like you look at, recruiting recruiters that are on my team, they make a base salary. They have to make that base salary back. And then once they do, they earn money, they earn commission on what they're producing. Right. You look at any other position where money and profit is being handled, they're being paid for it. And I feel like healthcare professionals finally like having that data can say, Hey, wait a minute, you know, how come I'm not getting paid more than $140,000 when Right. Here's what I'm making <laughs> the practice. And if I weren't here, oh, by the way, here's what the physician would have to be handling. Um, right. And they wouldn't be able to be handling more of the higher paid things like surgeries, et cetera. Sure. And, and what I would say is um, there's, a, at least in the orthopedics, especially world in 23 years of practice plus yeah. um, I've watched and they talk about it in the orthopedic professional literature as well we, we, mm -hmm. we have a major transition going on 
our surgeons are becoming employed. Uh, the MGMA says nine out of 10 graduating residents wants to be employed, not own their own practice and operate their own practice. Um, but historically in a lot of the private practices, well, more of an eat what you kill kind of model. Yeah. The, the, the harder you worked, the more you made. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, uh, when they're becoming employed providers, uh, in, in health systems and organizations, um, sometimes those organizations are good about maintaining some incentives so that people do who choose to work harder to get paid more. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the surgeons will point out and I've, you know, when they're in a salaried model, that there's not a lot of incentive to work harder if you're getting paid mm -mm. for doing less, you're getting paid more for doing less work. And then when you do more work, you're not necessarily getting paid a lot more. Yeah. And, yeah. and so um, I think that's a, that's a really challenging thing. And when a lot of health the PAs are employed in large health systems, they really struggle to differentiate the specialties. And that's very apparent because uh, they bundle, um, orthopedic PAs into, oh, well, our primary care PAs are making this much money. I'm right. But I, Two different I work, things. <laughs> I work another, yeah, yeah, I technically work another 50 to 75% on call. Um, right. That, you know, there's five of us staffing our service. If we worked hourly, they need eight people to staff what we do with five. And, yeah. and, and yeah. so how do we recognize that? And so um, I wouldn't phrase it, you know, originally started out mentioning, you know, hiring another PA versus a doctor. And I think in orthopedics, at least right now, we don't have an excess number of surgeons, um, especially mm -hmm. in my rural areas. So when I talk about people practicing in a rural environment, but it applies just as much in an urban environment is how do yeah. I make the doctors as efficient as possible? As possible. And, yeah. and, and I'm also professionally satisfied. And how do I, how yeah. do I see these, do the things that I like to do? And so I started a, a nerve cold treatment clinic where I do all the cold treatments for post-operative pain. So after surgery, patients that have uh, lower pain, but also patients who aren't good surgical candidates or patients who've had a total knee or joint mm -hmm. replacement before, I can do nerve treatments to reduce the pain if they're a smaller population that sometimes still have ongoing pain. Yeah, And that yeah. for me has differentiated me. We joined the Own the Bone Association for Osteoporosis Recognition and Prevention mm -hmm. Orthopedic Practice. It's ripe. We see these patients who go, wow, you've you had your second hip fracture and you've never had a DEXA scan or, you know, you, you have known osteoporosis in your chart and you've never been treated for it. And we're seeing you for a fracture. Okay. Let's call this out to our, our colleagues who can just see this for you in primary care or endocrinology yeah. or some orthopedic practices um, that are very interested, even at academic centers, they're using PAs and nurse practitioners to run their osteoporosis clinics. Mm -hmm. And they're not only treating fractures, but now I talked to some of these PAs and MPs and they're, now doing bone optimization before patients have joint replacements. And they're like, Hey, you have really bad bone, but you hit, need a hip or knee replacement. We're going to send you to our osteoporosis clinic. They're going to treat you for six months or a year and get you ready for surgery so that you have a better result after surgery. So the, yeah. the opportunities there are, 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 are hmm. fascinating. Yeah. I um, haven't heard of that. But That's cool. A, pit, a pitch again for like specialty organizations and advocacy, yeah. right? The, the American Academy of PAs does a very good job of a salary survey um, across yep. their population. And they, they put in information and they have orthopedics in there as well. But the PAs in orthosurgery, the subspecialty, the largest subspecialty for surgery at all, and all in, in mm -hmm. uh, PA practice, they have their own survey that goes into a super high level dive um, okay. RVU generation, different compensation models, call obligations, clinic structures, what procedures people are doing. Yeah. Do you, um, even things like, does your practice even show you what you generate? There's like 50% of practices don't share. Don't, they won't because they don't, don't want you to see. <laughs> they don't share what you're generating in RVUs or reimbursement. You know, a lot yeah. of practices just roll your call compensation into your base and right. then others, others pay for it. And so, right. Yep. Um, they uh, collect this data over their, their membership, which is over, I think, 2,500 PAs an hour or more, which is um, fantastic. It's a great data pool. And then mm -hmm. if you're a member, you get that as part of your membership. Or if you're not a member, you can pay for some of that data as well. But it's yep. a way they drive membership as well. But it's a huge service because you can look through that and say, yeah. you know what, our practice has the opportunity to do this or we do this right. well. Yeah. Sometimes when I interview at other places or I've looked at other jobs and I've been like, wow, this is tells me my I'm doing well at my job with for this yeah, benefit exactly. or these things and oh maybe we can ask them to do this and everyone would be a little happier um, yeah so, I see that uh, a lot from a talent acquisition standpoint like a lot of people 
and I don't mind it, right? Because that's why we're here. But people will reach out and they want to know, like, oh, what's the pay? Or, like, you know, what is the bonuses and what is the structure? Or have clients that they're like, hey, you know, we can't seem to retain our PAs. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your structure? Like, how are they paid? Oh, well, we just give them a flat salary. And I'm like, okay, well, they're expected to see a certain amount of people in the clinic. Yeah. Are they on call? Yeah. Are they first assist? Yeah. I'm like, okay. Like, I, I know why. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's, that's always so, a question when I get, is, like, is this a new position or is this a vacated position? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I yeah. mean, some places have figured it out and they've been able to retain talent. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the best way you can do it is to educate yourself on like, okay, the places that are retaining, I mean, clearly your practice, I would assume you've been there for a long time. They're treating you well enough for you to stay there and orthopedic PAs are in demand, you know, so because everyone has figured out like, oh crap, you know, there's not tons and tons of orthopedic surgeons we can hire, sure. but every year they're pushing out, like you said, 10,000 new people yeah. that, you know, if, if orthopedics number two, most people are open to it when I reach out to new grads. Yeah, orthopedics is definitely an interesting specialty. There's very few postgraduate training programs. And when patients ask um, about PA practice in orthopedics, you know, I, I point out there's 10 fellowships now for orthopedic surgeons about um, that are recognized. And yeah. that orthopedic surgeons are doing five years of postgraduate training for their residency. And then nine out of 10 of them are doing a fellowship. And another 10% are doing a second year long fellowship. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, we... Luckily, being in a smaller community, we have a pretty broad practice. I have friends who literally only do total hips or only work yep. for a hand surgeon, and the hand surgeon rarely needs an assistant in the OR in their practice, and so they're mainly in clinic doing evaluations mm-hmm. and pre- and post-op care um, versus uh, I have a friend who worked at one of the fellowship training programs, and she was critical, uh, and their microscope and mi- micro neurovascular stuff that they do, and that yeah. she does go to the operating room a lot. Um, yeah. And And... The, you mentioned that, you know, the data information, like I had a really interesting conversation last week with um, Trisha Neen, who um, was at Sullivan Cotter, and she helped Sullivan Cotter set up a advanced practice provider database that's like eight plus years she was there. And mm-hmm. now it's being run by a PA named Zach Hartzell, and they do an okay. amazing job of aggregating practice information from major health organizations and systems across the country. Down. And so they, uh, they now uh, have one of the largest banks of PA practice information, hmm. yeah. which is interesting to me. They have great information, but when I look at it, sometimes I think about comparing that with even like the PAOS survey, and you can tell a lot of the information they have is from health systems, but not yeah, necessarily with private practice. practices. Yeah, it's and, so and different. <laughs> still very large orthopedic private practice groups in Mm-hmm. Many parts of the country that pay very differently for their yeah. PAs and nurse practitioners. Um, you know, you think of big systems like Ortho Carolina and Ortho Indy um, that have done fantastic jobs. Uh, yeah. You talk about PA leaders. Uh, uh, Mike Harvey was at Ortho Indy and now he's at Forte and he's their clinical operations officer. And he mm-hmm. helps set up Ortho Indy's urgent cares and many of their practices. Yeah. Camille, Camille Carey is at Peninsula Orthopedics in Baltimore and he's their CEO. He's now gone wow. into being the practice CEO and he, I uh, run into his PAs and they really recognize the advantage of having a clinical leader um, uh, and that he really mm-hmm. recognizes and values their contribution to the practice. Yeah. And yeah. he's, uh, he's, he's going to, he'll, he'll be speaking at American Academy of orthopedic executives um, at the end of April with Mike Chicago. Harvey and yeah. And Dennis Rivenberg, um, they're all going to be speaking about, um, how to optimize use of PAs and, and PAs yeah. in your practice. Good. So it, good. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's I really was going to go see to that. that. You are? <laughs> I was going to. Okay. I'm trying. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know. It's, it's so hard nowadays to escape, you know, as a small business, I taking time away from recruiting and mm-hmm. <laughs> providing for my clients, but I'm hoping sure. that Next year, they're actually in Atlanta, so they'll be in my backyard, so really? it'll be much okay. easier for me to, to yeah. come and go to that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, to your point, you know, it's, it is tough. Uh, we get, we, we need 50 hours a year as a CME to maintain our national certification. Mm-hmm. But um, for instance, my employer here gives us 40 hours of covered time off to do that. 
Oh, awesome. Um, and, and so that's fairly good. Uh, uh, but uh, they recently reduced it to 24 hours. And I said, you want us to be board certified, but you're reducing us to 24 hours. <laughs> Because they said, well, we're raising other people up who hadn't had that same 40 hours, which I had advocated yeah. for when I was a director. But I drove myself to San Francisco for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Oh, yeah. Um, How was that one this year? It was good. It was in San Francisco. And it, um, definitely a lot of logistics for people and people coming in to the city. And so mm -hmm. um, next year, it's going to be in San Diego. And San Diego is always one of their highest attended events. And so I know I love San Diego as well. Yeah, yeah. I drove from that conference to La Jolla to go to the AAPA conference, and I did that all with, on vacation time. I had to burn my own vacation time to get the CME and, and use the time. But I enjoy yeah. them, you know, but it's, you talk about the challenges as well, right? We yeah, want that's our not good. to be board certified, and we want our PAs to be board certified, but we know we're not giving them enough time off to actually maintain their board Do it. Certified. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. So that's always one of those interesting challenges as well. I think they should give you that PTO time back. If they're listening, you should give it back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm I, just I, kidding. I am hoping to go to AOE for the first time actually ever for me uh, this year. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I've heard but it's I'll... fantastic. I had um, yeah. one of my clients who went last year when it was in Florida, and I'm kicking myself for not going to that one because it was a trip to Florida. Right. Um, but – yeah, this year I won't be going. Chicago is just a little bit too far for me with everything that's going on. Um, but I've heard it's, you know, tremendous. And there's a lot of people that go to that and who have actually, I guess I don't mean to speak ill on any organization, but have said they enjoy that more so than the AOS, which I know AAOS right. is a little different in terms of who goes, but. <laughs> right. I mean, um, for, for someone who wants number stuff on HR and employment like you do, that's yes. AOE. Exactly. Yeah. For someone who wants clinical, current clinical practice things. And exactly. AOS is helpful. And then what's really nice is um, they've reorganized the media meeting. Dr. Mm -hmm. Matt Proventure is the chair of the annual meeting committee. And he recognized okay. some of the challenges and they shifted it in the week and took it off the weekend. And then mm -hmm. they, book, they bookended specialty days last year on the front and the end and this year on the end to try and shift the load. And so uh, not only did I go to the annual meeting, but I also was able to attend the OTA and the foot and ankle societies combined specialty day meeting at the end, which was awesome. actually a fantastic um, yeah. day. So cool. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like you had a lot of conferences. I'll have to message you after to see which ones you, you think are the best. Cause I'm, I'm just now getting into that since my business, yeah. I started, you know, 2022 end of that year. I'm just now getting to a point where I'm like, okay, I can go and for a few days network because it gets to a point too, where you want that FaceTime and you want to learn from the people and, and what right. they're doing and what are the trends and all that. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that you're having the chance to go to that and you'll have well, to go next year too in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I know I, I enjoy the, not only the educational, but it is again, and to your point, it's the networking. And yeah. um, the education side as well. I like teaching for the PAOS and the OTA. Mm -hmm. and I taught for the AOS and the AAPA. We did the radiology and the injections workshop last year in Nashville when we were both yeah. in Nashville. Um, yeah. That was a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I enjoy that part as well. And it's really where I've actually built more opportunities, like things that led to me volunteering with the AOS and I was yeah. on the annual meeting committee. Um, as a, a volunteer, because they don't even have it in the bylaws yet for a PA to participate, but they said we, we want input. And now yeah. I'll be um, volunteering for a subcommittee where they're looking to develop new curriculum for the annual meeting. Very cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So fun, fun things like that. I, and I think at this point in my career, it's I super enjoy my clinical care. But mm -hmm. at the same idea, time, I find it really helpful when I'm like training at the local PA yeah. school. Or yeah. helping practicing PAs at these meetings when we do these sub meetings, I really enjoy that part of the education mm -hmm. as well, and, and getting them up to speed and getting them confident and competent, and so they yeah. can feel like they're getting the best contribution. One hundred percent. Yeah. No, I think yeah. it's fantastic all the volunteering you do. You're you're much more altruistic than I am. <laughs> Makes me feel bad about myself. <laughs> I, awesome. I sometimes I feel like sometimes it's a bit self selfish because I do get I, no. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. If you enjoy it. And I think that all goes towards advocation as well. Like I always say advocation is not always standing outside of the white house with a picket sign. It's sometimes yeah. just doing what you can with where you're at. And I think you've, you've proven that point, right. That you can always teach somebody something, learn from somebody else and, 
if it's all going towards the greater good of making people aware and, and pushing for things that make sense, then you're doing advocation in that. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, this has been fun. I have enjoyed learning from you and all the things I, I truly didn't know about some of the stuff you were talking about. So it's been helpful for me and I'm sure for listeners as well. Um, we'll have to have you come back on once you've gone to some of these conferences and learn new things, but thank you so much for joining us today. No, I super appreciate it. Um, the one thing we didn't talk about that I, I think is really fascinating right now too, and came up a bunch yeah. at AAPA's um, executive leadership conferences, mm. the use of professional coaches, executive coaches. A lot of the leaders were talking about um, yeah. executive coaching. And so that's something I just started exploring as well. And so there's awesome. a surgeon who does professional coaching for other surgeons and he set up a training program through the international coaching federation mm -hmm. so you can get a coach certification and at the meeting i learned how many of these pas um, who are in leadership roles and who were doing advocacy or other um, additional activities had utilized coaching services to make them stronger mm -hmm. in their roles and help their career ladder yeah and so um uh, and I, I think you talked about that on some of the other podcasts, but I think that's really an interesting thing that's happening now. And I'm seeing mm -hmm. more and more PAs get into that um, world as well. And I think that's another way to give back to the profession yeah. and yeah. help others be successful and grow in their careers and, and increase the impact of the profession too. 100%. Yeah. I actually do some HR consulting with a coaching company there. Um, they have a platform where they hire coaches more so on like the leadership development for enterprise companies, but I find mentorship and learning and all of that, like it is best taught through somebody else that has been there and done that. That's why I have this podcast because I'm like, I could sit there and read a book about everything to do with orthopedics and PAs and physicians, or I could just invite somebody on to talk about it and learn it directly from them. Well, <laughs> and that's the, more fun. <laughs> the person I mentioned who's retired from Solomon Cotter, Trish, she set up a consulting business where she does do yeah. some coaching and, and organizational consulting and she coached um, the the lead APP at Oshner, Emily, okay. and Emily has now set up at Oshner. They now are training internally their own coaching in their yeah. uh, PA and MP leaders, and so that they cool. can in, she increase their um, satisfaction and career ladder and um, development of their APPs, um, and so they're yeah. developing their own coaching staff in the APP department as well. Super That's fantastic. Anyway, yeah. It's another whole other thing to talk about. No, time. I know. I love that stuff too from like performance yeah. management with like planning mm -hmm. for who's coming up and training and promoting within. Like I could talk right. about that for hours, but. <laughs> and, the biz and the business world is so much better at healthcare, but there are a lot of yeah. organizations are recognizing that PAs and MPs as clinicians can make very good um, clinical leaders with yeah. the insight of a, a perspective of a clinician. 100%. And, and uh, you're seeing places like Stanford who developed their own fellowship and leadership institute mm -hmm. through their advanced practice um, council and um, other yeah. organizations are doing similar things. So it, it'll be interesting to see that momentum grow. Yeah. I'm looking yeah. forward to it as well. Cause when I started recruiting in healthcare, when I was in college, it, it was like, there was no leaders that had any clinical perspective whatsoever. And now it's like most of my clients are clinicians who took over lead APP roles and or moved into C-level positions where, yeah. you know, they earned their seat at the table and now they're the ones that are making decisions that are not just some healthcare executive. <laughs> right. No, I'll have to share offline some of these other PAs contacts um, at these yeah. organizations like the CEO in Baltimore and Mm -hmm. uh, Mike and Ortho um, and Forte now in Indianapolis or Zach Hartzell sure. at Sullivan Cotter all yeah. PAs, all in different leadership roles and ways Super of cool. really growing the profession. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Perfect. We can definitely connect about that. I'll have them on yeah. the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been fun. And to everyone else that's listening, if you want to connect with Dan, he is all over LinkedIn. Um, so you can connect with him there. And if there's anything else um, from the coaching perspective, Dan, that you want to share with folks, I'll make sure to link it here in the show notes as well. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll right. get to the information for Surgeon Masters, which is who yes. does the coaching. Perfect. Yes. I've actually heard of that. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Take care. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Healthy Careers Podcast, where we provide a platform for you to ask hard questions and get real answers. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends. Stay tuned for more episodes every other Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern.